Hi, I'm John Hartman. Welcome to another installment of Leveling Up with US Chess. The idea behind this series is simple. It's always fun to look at the great games of players like Morphe, Fisher, or Caruana, but it can also be instructive to try and understand common errors made by beginning and club players. By studying their games, we can pick out typical mistakes and try to avoid them when we're at the board. This week's game is between Lara Omidvar and Rajkumar Anbu from the 4NCL Online League this past April. There are lots of interesting decisions to discuss, so without further ado, let's get to the game. All right, so in this game, uh, white opens with e4. Bobby Fischer said it was best by test, and for most beginning players, I suspect he's right. Again, uh, for those of you who watched the video last week, you remember there are three things you, or a couple weeks ago, there are a few things that uh, you need to do in the opening. First thing you need to do is try to control the center by putting one of your pawns there, either the e pawn or the d pawn, preferably. Second thing you need to do, develop your minor pieces, your knights and your bishops. By playing 1e4, white opens the door, so to speak, for the bishop on f1 to get out. Uh, the queen on d1 uh, can also get out, although it's probably not best to bring the queen out quite so early in the game. Finally, third thing you need to do in the opening is castle. And again, by playing e4 and then developing the minor pieces, uh, you're, you're helping to get that king out the back door to safety by uh, getting ready to castle, uh, usually on the king's side, at least in an e4, e5 opening. At any rate, white plays e4, black plays e5, for many of the same reasons, planting a flag in the center, opening the door for the bishop to get out and the queen, uh, depending on your, uh, your, your strategic plan. Um, white responds knight f3, again a very logical move, perhaps the best move, developing a piece, attacking the pawn on e5. Black defends with knight to c6, and white continues to develop by playing bishop to c4. Now, this is a position that many of you will have seen many, many times in your chess career. And really here the two moves that are, are probably best are bishop to c5 and knight to f6. Black decided to play a different move, playing knight to h6. And the idea with knight to h6, uh, perhaps, is that it defends the pawn on f7, which is always a target in e4, e5 openings. But uh, you may have heard the saying that knights on the rim are dim. And this is a case where having a knight on the edge of the board is perhaps not fantastic, because if you look at the, the squares it can control, it only controls, what, uh, four squares from the edge of the board. Whereas if we, for example, went back and played knight to f6, well, this knight would now be attacking the pawn on e4, would be uh, attacking g4, h5, d5, d7, protecting e8, could go back to g8, and also h7. So instead of only being able to go to four squares, it can go to eight. Knights on the edge of the board are... are not well placed in in most cases and really this this is no exception so with knight to h6 we are uh, defending f7 but the the knight is not very well placed as we're going to see now white could just keep developing uh, could play knight to c3 could castle but i think a, a very reasonable move here was played and that's d4 saying them um, well if, if you're going to have your knight on the edge of the board where it's not really controlling the center or or influencing uh, or, or, or attacking my pieces, I'm going to open the center up and I'm going to try to get my pieces to the center as quickly as I can. So d4, white takes, knight takes, and here I think the best move is absolutely bishop to c5, developing, uh, enacting a two-fold attack on the knight on d4 where we've got two pieces attacking and only one defender. Um, and the idea is that if, if uh, white plays a slow move here like castles, you can simply take the knight on d4 and, and win a piece for free. Instead, um, black decided to play knight takes d4, and I think this is a mistake. Even though it doesn't lose material, even though material is even after queen takes d4, the point is that the queen now is on a central square where it can attack lots of different squares. It can go, well, it can't, you know, uh, go uh, on any squares where its own pieces are, but... Uh, it can go uh, quite a distance in, in just about any direction. And the problem is now there's no knight on c6 to come out and chase it away. So it's going to be very, very hard to get rid of this uh, this queen. Uh, Black decided to play b6. Uh, sort of a logical move. Uh, hoping to fianchetto the bishop, put the bishop on bishop to b7, uh, where it can fight for the center. And now white plays a move that looks immensely strong. Um but it is actually probably not the best move. I suspect the best move here would be bishop takes h6. 
and we'll, we'll see why in a moment. Uh, bishop h6 is going to try to remove a defender uh, for a reason that will be very, very important in just a second. Uh, I think the, the, the move that they played here was queen to d5. And the idea behind queen to d5 is very, very simple. It looks like we have a double attack. It looks like we are attacking the pawn on f7, perhaps threatening checkmate, and we're also attacking this undefended rook on a8. Now the problem is that after a move like c6, there is no mate threat on f7. Because if queen takes f7, that knight, which looked pretty silly on the edge, suddenly looks really, really smart. Knight takes f a, uh, f7, bishop takes, king takes, and lo and behold, white is down a queen. Not what you want. So, uh, in order to have that queen d5 threat really, really be scary, it might make sense to play bishop takes h6 first. Now, the other thing that's uh, kind of nice about this move is that black can't take back. Because if they do, they lose that undefended queen, uh, the, the undefended rook on h8. So, uh, going back, queen d5 is perhaps premature. Um, but black freaks out, doesn't play c6, which stops the threat against the a8 rook. And uh, realizing that this particular threat on f7 is covered by the knight and the, and the king. Instead, black plays queen to f6. So defending the, the pawn on f7, even though it doesn't need to be defended, this lets white grab the rook for free. So now, uh, after queen takes a8, the problem is now that this bishop, the bishop on c8, is under attack and is undefended. So uh, black could play king to d8, uh, just moving the king over to try to protect it. But I think they played a very reasonable move given the circumstances, queen to d8. Uh, so that the king can eventually castle. White decides to keep grabbing material, and why not? Queen takes a7. Black plays bishop to b4 check. And now c3 would be a very reasonable move, just attacking the bishop and asking it to move once again. But white decided to play knight to c3. Developing, but putting the knight in a pin. This could become important in the game. It's not such a huge issue. Still, uh, for that reason, I do think c3 is probably best. So a pin, by the way, is a situation where a piece, like a knight, is functionally immobilized. Because you can't move the knight uh, to put your king in check. If, if we tried to move the knight, our king would be in check, and you can never do that. That's an illegal move in chess. So, in this particular situation, the knight, we say, is pinned to the king. Now, you can also have situations, excuse me, where a knight can be pinned to the queen. In those cases, you, you can move the knight. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could do it. And so in that case, that's a relative pin. Uh, this, what we have on the board here, is an absolute pin. And um, again, in this particular situation, it's not really that big a deal. Uh, beginners sometimes get very, very freaked out about pins and, and try to avoid them at all costs by, like, uh, you know, for example, in, in this position, maybe they would say, oh, I want to play, I want to play knight to c3, but I'm worried about a pin, so I'm going to play a2 to a3 first. You probably don't need to do that in most cases. Uh, moving the, the, the pawns in front of the rooks is, is generally not a good idea unless you have a very concrete reason for doing so. Um, but I, I see a lot of beginners doing that, and it's worth mentioning. Any rate, queen takes a7 was the game. Bishop to b4 check. Uh, the king could move, but then we'd lose castling rights. Uh, we could play bishop to d2 as well. That's a very reasonable move. But I, again, I think c3 is probably best. Knight c3 is the move that is played, enacting that pin. And now black decides to try to counterattack as best uh, as best they can. So knight to g4, trying to uh, at least put some pressure on some of the sensitive points around the white king. White castles, and now queen to h4. So black has a concrete threat here. Uh, and if you don't see it, immediately pause the video for just a moment and see if you can figure out what the threat is. Okay. Hopefully you pause the video uh, if you needed to. The threat here is very simple. The threat is queen takes h2 checkmate. And so now it becomes a question of how does white respond? Um, in the game they played h3, which is perfectly fine. Uh, it stops the mate threat. It attacks the knight. Uh, just, just for what it's worth, you could also play here queen takes c7, grabbing another pawn, and also directly defending the uh, the pawn on h2. So that the idea is now, if they take it, thinking it's checkmate, well, now they've lost their queen. 
Well, they've lost a knight, rather, because we had to give up our queen to defend. But still, we're up even more material. At the moment, we are now up um, a rook and a pawn, it looks like, which is pretty good for move 14. Anyway, so after queen h4, queen c7, queen takes c7 would be a very, very strong move. But um, h3, so stopping the mate threat. Black decides to continue to put pressure on the king by playing bishop to c5. And so now... Uh, we have, before I talked about a two-fold attack, right now we have what amounts to a three-fold attack. Three pieces attacking one square, and only two pieces defending it. Anytime you have a mismatch like that, or an overload, there is a chance to win material. So white is going to have to do something. And white has a couple of choices. White could try uh, simply taking the, uh, taking the knight. And then if black decided to want to keep up the threat by playing bishop to d6, uh, it gets very it gets a little complicated here. It looks like you can play bishop to c4. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, pawn to c uh, pawn to f4, <laughs> pawn to f4 to try to, to stop the threat. Um, because now the queen uh, there's no more checkmate on h2. The problem is now that the dark squares around the white king are uh, incredibly weak, and in fact white gets mated here in four with bishop to c5 check. Um, and at this point, really all white can do is, is postpone it. So something like bishop to e3, just trying to block, capture, rook to f2, capture. And now no matter where the king goes on the h-file, king to h1, queen h4 checkmate. And uh, these squares are both covered. The check is given. The white king is checkmated. Now the good news is that after uh, h takes g4, Bishop to, uh, bishop to d6, you don't need to play f4 to stop the mate. You can simply play rook to e1, and then if uh, black tries to deliver the checkmate with queen to h2, the king can run to safety to f1, and eventually out wherever it might need to go. Uh, so h takes g4 is, is playable, but uh, in the game, white decided on something else that's actually probably just as good. Bishop to e3. So, I mean, we're up material. There is no reason for us not to try to trade pieces. Uh, even though we do have to give back a pawn here after knight takes e3, f takes e3, bishop takes e3, check. King to h1, getting out of check. And now, black decides to uh, keep up the pressure uh, and play bishop to f4. So let's, let's stop and talk about this position. The idea here is actually pretty clear, I think. What black wants to do is play, uh, after bishop f4, play queen to g3 followed by queen to g uh, to h2, checkmate. As such, there are a couple things we can do. Um, first thing we could do is we could even probably just take the take the bishop and give back a little bit of material. And uh, after rook takes, queen takes, we are still up. We're still up a piece, right? We're still up a knight. And uh, a knight is usually more than enough to win a game. There are some other things we could do. We could play knight to e2 to stop the queen from going to g3, because now if the queen goes to g3, we just take it. We could even play knight to d5. Knight to d5 is kind of an interesting move, because we're threatening to play knight takes c7 with check, and we're also attacking the knight, uh, the bishop on, on f4. In fact, again, we have one of those two-fold attacks. Two pieces attacking one piece, and only one piece defending it. So we have a chance to win material here if black does nothing. In the game... White played queen to b8. So this is an instance, I think, of where um, white... You know, queen to b8 is actually not a terrible move in itself. It threatens to win the bishop on c8, to give check to the king, which is on e8. Um, and as such, you know, even, if, even after queen to g3, we still have time... We still have time, to some degree, to uh, get out of this. So, like, check... Here, well, this is this uh, this is actually beginning to be a bit of a problem now. Oh no, just knight to d5, knight to d5 check, and then, um, yeah, I suspect uh, we're, black should be able to get out of this without much difficulty. I'm, I'm sorry, white should be able to get out of this without much difficulty. I'm actually checking this because I'm not sure. Yeah, after king e6, knight f4 check. Yeah, took a second for me to figure that out. Um. But instead, after castles, when there's no longer a chance to take the bishop and, and, and win it, um, 
white sort of turned off their 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 danger signal. They sort of turned off their awareness of of, of the key threat here. And again, instead of playing something like knight d2, which again, you know, stops the the queen from going to g3, and uh, threatens the the threatens a double a twofold attack on the bishop on f4, we are in a situation where um, white makes a, a terrible blunder g3, thinking that they are attacking the uh, they're forking or double attacking the queen and the bishop, but forgetting that after queen takes h3, king g1, queen takes g3, king h1, queen h2, it's checkmate. Bit of a roller coaster this game. Uh, white was white was doing very, very well a a after the opening and after winning the rook on a8. And after we got to this position with knight to g4 and queen h4, Really, I mean, if you again, if you look at the development of the pieces, um, you know, this bishop is over here, not really helping out that much. These two pieces are the only developed pieces that are attacking the king. White really should have no trouble defending this and 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 winning with being up so much material. But as we saw in the game, um, White did a number of things right: h3, stopping the mate; bishop to c5; bishop to e3, bringing another defender over to f2; takes, takes, takes; king h1. Bishop to f4. Here they kind of turned off their 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 awareness, their danger signal, and um, yeah, if if they'd found any of these ways to get you know to to either just get rid of the bishop right away and and, and get rid of the mate threat immediately, or even after queen to b8, which you know, is a very logical move, uh, threatening the bishop on on c8, after castles, uh, just playing knight to e2, something very simple like this, which which stops all the mate stuff. Um, white has a essentially a completely one game here and. Yeah, it, it's it's um, it's testament to the fact that you really need to stay awake, uh, even even in simple looking positions, even where you think you can't possibly lose. Trust me, I've I've lost plenty of those. Uh, so, you know, keep your tactical antennae uh, and antennas uh, stoked and and and, and working, and uh, you're gonna have a much better shot of winning more of your games. All right, so we're just over well, we're at 17 minutes, so we're gonna call it a video here. I hope you have uh, learned something by watching this. We will be back next week with a new video for leveling up until then uh keep working on your chess stay home um and uh yeah and and study 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 we'll see you next week